Good afternoon, folks. This is Michael Donahue. Uh, I'm a seasonal ranger here at Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument. I'd like to welcome you to a kind of a new series uh, on some of the artwork on the uh, area known as Custer's Last Stand here on the battlefield. Um, I think you'll find this interesting because it's going to deal with some of the myths in the art. It's also uh, uh, giving you a little chronology of when things were done and, uh, and what the artist was trying to do with some of these, pe these pieces of artwork. The, uh, the most painted hill in the world uh, is where Jesus Christ was crucified. Sometimes people call it Golgotha or a Calvary. Uh, again, if you look at the history of art, probably the most painted hillside. However, it's intriguing to know that the second most painted hillside in the world is right here on the battlefield. Uh, it's sometimes known as Custer Hill or Custer's Last Stand Hill, where approximately about 40 men, along with George Custer, died uh, at the end. And uh, uh, there's a lot of mystery, a lot of myth about what actually happened when Custer died. But we're going to talk about how artists have rendered this, both uh, American Indian artists and uh, the early newspaper accounts, and even some famous painters like Remington and Russell, and how they dealt with the subject of Custer's Last Stand. Uh, the Eamon Carter Museum of Western Art in Fort Worth, Texas, actually did an exhibition of some of these paintings uh, in 1968. They tried to find all of them that existed in the world. And what they cataloged were over 600 works of art that dealt with this little hill up here. Uh, interesting enough, uh, there's been a lot of production since 1968, and I would think, uh, having done a little research, that there's probably between 800 and 900 images of this one hill. So today, again, we're going to start this new series, and it's going to be called The Death on a Hillside, The Anatomy of an American Myth. One of the things that we want to talk about for a few minutes is that there's basically four categories that artwork falls into uh, when you look at the last Anne Hill paintings. Uh, number one, soldiers and warriors sometimes are depicted intertwined in hand-to-hand -hand combat, either on foot or horseback. Uh, we're going to look at one of those today. Uh, also, you might have a focus uh, on just the soldier band, what they were doing on Custer's Last Stand Hill. Uh, a third category is focus on the warrior perspective. Well, what did they see? Uh, what did they look like? We're going to see some of that in, in this uh, particular lecture series as well. And then the fourth one is aerial views that incorporate several episodes of the battle simultaneously. And you'll see that in a lot of the, uh, uh, the native drawings by people like Whitebird and others who will show you the entire battle uh, in a very interesting narrative way. The first image ever created of Custer's Last Stand Hill was done by an illustrator by the name of William M. Carey. And it was called The Battle of the Little Bighorn River, The Death Struggle of George Custer, which uh, today is in the Library of Congress collection. Uh, it was done, you ready for this? Two weeks after the battle. Uh, earliest known image of the fight. And it was done as a woodcut, which is a printmaking technique where you take a piece of boxwood, uh, you do a very careful detailed drawing on that block of wood, and then you'll take a very sharp engraving tool, uh, and you will dig out the areas that are going to be white in the image. Once you dig those out, that leaves a raised area, kind of like a rubber stamp, and you will ink those raised areas, and that's what you see here, the black ink on the raised areas, which is printed on a piece of white paper, run through a printing press, you can print hundreds or thousands of these images, and this is the way they basically produced images for newspapers in the 1860s and 1870s. So uh, you can appreciate the dedicated work that went into uh, all those little black lines which are carved out of wood, if you can imagine that. Now, what you see, of course, is the emphasis on George Armstrong Custer in this piece. He's centered in the middle uh, in his uh, buckskin suit with his, uh, with his foot on top of a, a dead white horse. Uh, and this is a real action-packed scene. He centers Custer. Custer, in this case, is the, 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 the focal point. But he's just got the entire composition loaded with action. The warriors coming up and creeping around. The small band of soldiers kind of circled around behind Custer. Uh, some dead in the foreground. 
a warrior dehorsed in the foreground as well, left foreground, and one soldier with a saber swinging over there at the other side had a warrior with a war club with daggers in it. And what you see is, again, tremendous action. Uh, the artist unified this piece by having everyone touching everyone. And that's a, an interesting uh, uh, design principle called unity through proximity. And it adds harmony and interest, and, and you kind of are led across the piece. This particular uh, work was in a newspaper first, New York Graphic and Illustrated Newspaper. And by the way, Kerry was uh, extremely qualified to do this image because in 1861, he went up the Missouri River and got off the boat and got to interview and draw and sketch uh, Indians along the Missouri. So he got to see what they looked like, what they wore, and those sketchbooks were brought back for future use. Also, he got to witness the 7th Cavalry. He went with uh, Major Marcus Reno with the 7th Cav up along the border of the U.S. Canadian Survey, which was done in, in 1874. So, so Kerry actually did sketches of the 7th Cav soldiers, knew what they kind of looked like and what they wore. And so he took all that knowledge and used it in this particular image. What about myths? Because we as human beings will look at an image and we begin to believe this is the actual historic narrative. And uh, that's one of the things we'll talk about in this series is how our, our judgments and our opinions and uh, our ideas about a historic action take, uh, take on a new life when you look at artworks like this. We think, well, that's the way it happened. But of course, there's always going to be almost an error or historical inaccuracy in everything. And that's not to take anything away from the artist, by the way. Uh, especially this guy right here, because he only had two weeks of research to do for this image. Uh, but you see George Custer with his buckskin suit on, uh, and that is an era. He did have pants on with buckskin, but he had taken his jacket off. Uh, as the soldier said, he wore, went into combat without his jacket because it was about 93 degrees the day of the fight. Uh, he did not have his saber. That was a hand-to-hand -hand combat weapon the soldiers didn't like to carry. And the weapons, except for a couple of them, were all packed up and left at the, uh, the, at the river boat or lived at the depot along the Powder River before they got to Little Bighorn. Custer is firing at that warrior riding by him. He's firing an 1873 uh, Colt revolver, which he didn't carry here, probably. And then again, you see a soldier to the left of the horse over in the left-hand corner with a saber. He wouldn't have had his saber either. Uh, ironically enough, there was a dead white horse down there in Custer's body. And so there may be a little bit of... Uh, of uh, historical accuracy in that dead horse. One of the other things that you will notice as far as the Indian garb and Indian attire, and uh, Ken Woody, chief of Interp, who is one of the world's leading experts on uh, teepees and, and uh, the things that people made and carried here. Uh, one of the things you'll notice in the warrior at the lower left-hand corner and the warrior who's just about to kill Custer with his revolver is that they have their quivers strung across their backs. And you see that in a lot of Hollywood movies. And what you have is uh, Mr. Woody has showed us that they would be uh, having them in the front or the side of their body rather than the back. Much easier to access, uh, get a hold of your, your arrows if you need to in combat. So that's another one of those misconceptions. You see crooked lances. Uh, warriors did carry those here at Little Bighorn. But just an action-packed, uh, phenomenal work. Landscape is completely wrong. Again, uh, Kerry had not come out to the battlefield to see what it looked like. It looks like volcanoes and huge mountains, and we know that Little Bighorn is basically rolling hills. So again, uh, you have to pay homage to Kerry for his first attempt here of doing an image of the Last Stand Hill. And we'll be looking at some other ones soon, and we appreciate you following along with us today here at Little Bighorn. And again, uh, this is going to be a, hopefully a series on artwork of Last Stand. This is Michael Donahue. Thank you for joining us.